In the book of the prophet Ezekiel, we read these very important words in regards to today's saint. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. Cor carneum. Words taken from the holy prophet Ezekiel for today's saint, saint that John Eudes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we honor the 17th century French home missionary, St. John Eudes. We saw the problems of France as flowing from an ill-formed clergy. Those wicked shepherds spoken of by the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Ezekiel and the prophet Jeremiah. France, during this time, during his time, was also suffering from the heresy of Jansenism, which was condemned in St. John Eudes' lifetime by Pope Innocent X in 1653 and recondemned again by Pope Alexander VI in 1656. Like the Pharisees, a Jansenist often places too much emphasis on external acts as well as their own opinion. They're pretty proud of themselves, and they think they know better than everybody else. Thus, they could look holy on the outside, have all the right ideas oftentimes even, by their actions and what they say, but the disposition of their heart was hard and cold. They could make detailed confessions, yet they never changed. They always thought they knew better than the clergy which is not surprising given the state of things. They were for democracy. Thus, St. Francis de Sales described their works as pharisaical phantoms of virtue. Now, whenever most of the people are not striving for holiness, as in our time, there's always a danger for those who do. They stand out so easily and begin to take themselves a little too seriously. Thus, they can fall into what seems to be Jansenism, at least on the surface. But I want to put a bookmark there, and I don't want to talk about that today. I want to talk about that another time. But I have found this to be the case. The word Jansenistic is used a little too freely by people, it seems to me. And oftentimes, those who are pointing the finger at others, saying you're Jansenistic, have themselves a tinge or more of Jansenism, being very proud of their own opinions, and not willing to be led by someone in the hierarchy. Let's return to St. John Hughes. He sought remedies for this among his people. And among the remedies he chose, or he was inspired to use, was, of course, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He helped to establish the Feast of the Holy Heart of Mary, which was celebrated for the first time in 1648 and that of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in 1672. Isn't that amazing? The Feast of the Holy Heart of Mary preceded the Sacred Heart of Jesus. All right. The Mass and the office proper to these were composed by Father Eudes, who thus had the honor of preceding St. Margaret Mary in establishing devotion to the Sacred Hearts. For this reason, Pope Leo XIII, in proclaiming his virtues heroic in 1903, gave him the title of author of the liturgical worship of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Holy Heart of Mary. Pope St. Pius X acclaimed St. John Hughes to be the father, the doctor, and the apostle of the devotion to the Sacred Hearts. He said this in his decree of beatification. St. John died on this day, 78 years of age, in 1680. Now, since the month of August is dedicated to the Immaculate Heart, we are in the octave of the Assumption as well. Let us turn to some of the wonderful writings of St. John Eudes on the Immaculate Heart of Mary, most notably his conference on her heart of flesh. That's what we need is a soft and tender heart like our mother, her corporeal heart. And so St. John teaches us things like this. Just as everything in our Lord Jesus Christ is great and admirable, so also everything that concerns Mary, his mother, is replete with grandeur and marvels. 
Every part of the sacred humanity of the Son of God is deified and raised to an infinite dignity through its union with the divinity. So likewise, everything in the Blessed Virgin Mary is ennobled and sanctified by her divine maternity. There's no part, there's no part of the sacred body of the God-man that is not worthy of eternal admiration of angels and men. And so, there is nothing in the virginal body of the Mother of God that is unworthy of the eternal praise of all creatures. We may therefore conclude that her blessed heart, first and worthiest part, is deserving of a special veneration. Now, he says, there are five marvelous prerogatives of the corporeal heart of Mary, which render it forever worthy to receive the veneration of men and angels. The first prerogative consists in the fact that the heart is the principle of life. Is it not? It's the principle of life of our Holy Mother, Mary. It is the principle of all the functions of her bodily, material life, ever holy in itself, and in its every function and employment. It is the source of the life of the Mother of God, the life of her who gave birth to the only Son of God, the life of the woman through whom God gave life to all the children of Adam. He's thinking here of the baptismal font. She is our mother. All the children of Adam sunk as they were in the abyss of eternal death. Finally, her heart is the source of a life so holy, so noble, so sublime, that it is more precious in the sight of God than the lives of all the angels and men. That's the first prerogative. Second prerogative. So the first one, the principle of life of Mary and all that flows from that life came from her heart. Second prerogative of the corporal heart of Mary is that it produced the virginal blood with which the sacred body of the God-man was formed in the chaste womb of the Blessed Mother. Out of her heart, says Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda, came three drops at the time of Gabriel's visitation. And with those three drops, the Holy Ghost formed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The third prerogative of Mary's heart of flesh is that it was the source of the human material life of the infant Jesus during the nine months that he dwelt in Mary's sacred womb. While the infant is in its mother's bosom, the mother's heart is to such an extent the source of the infant's life that both mother and infant can be said to depend upon it for their existence. Her heart fed his heart. Her heart produced the blood and what not that he needed for a sustenance. Mary's admirable heart was therefore the source of the two most noble and precious lives at once the source of the holy life of the mother of God and of her only son, the humanly divine as well as the divinely human life of the God-man. Now the fourth prerogative of the admirable heart of Mary is noted in the words of her, of the holy bride, the divine bridegroom from the Song of Songs, that is of Mary to Jesus, who is her son and her father, her brother and her spouse. He's the new Adam, she's the new Eve. And thus the line from the Song of Songs he's speaking of is, our bed is flourishing. That is, he says, our bed is covered and perfumed with flowers. What is this bed? It is the pure heart of the Blessed Virgin, where the divine infant so gently rested. You can think of all the statues depicting our Blessed Mother holding the infant at her breast. It was a great privilege for St. John, the apostle, the beloved disciple, to have rested once on the Savior's adorable breast, from which he drew such great light and derived the knowledge of so many marvelous secrets. But that was only once. But not only once, but many times did our divine Savior rest on the virginal heart of his dearest mother. What abundance of lights, of grace, and of blessings 
the eternal Son, the very source of light and grace, must have poured into the maternal heart on which he rested so often. Her heart never interposed the slightest obstacle to divine grace. On the contrary, she was always disposed to welcome every celestial favor. Our Lord loved her heart more than all other hearts put together. That's what the saints all say. He loved her heart more than all the hearts put together and was in turn loved by it more perfectly than all the hearts of all the seraphim. Oh, what union, what intimacy, what understanding, what correspondence between these two hearts. What fire in these two furnaces of love, constantly inflamed by the breath of the Holy Ghost. And now we come to the fifth prerogative of this holy heart. It is the altar upon which a great and perpetual sacrifice, most agreeable to God, is constantly offered. On it are immolated all the natural passions which reside in the human heart. Man's revolt against the commandments of God caused all these passions to revolt against ourselves, against our own hearts, to fall into such disorder that instead of being completely subject to the will, which is the queen of all the other soul's faculties, they often make it their slave. Instead of being the guardians of the heart in which they reside, preserving it in peace and tranquility, says St. John, the passions usually become as many executioners who torment the heart and fill it with conflict and war. Such was not the case with the passions that reside in the corporeal heart of the queen of angels, for they were always entirely subject to her reason and to the divine will that held sovereign sway over every part of her soul and body. Oh, blessed heart, so completely closed to the vanities of the earth, and of self-interest, that not one trace of them ever could be found in thee. Thy confidence in God was equaled by thy firm trust in the divine bounty, and fired with holy generosity, never didst thou give way before the obstacles raised by hell and the world to prevent thee from advancing along the path of sacred love but thou didst always surmount them with unremitting constancy and invincible strength. Blessed indeed are the hearts of the true children of Mary, who strive to live in conformity with the most holy heart of their mother most admirable. Above all, what veneration is merited by the heart that God himself loved and glorified most highly, the heart that adored and loved God more perfectly than all the hearts in heaven and upon the earth for all time. May every heart praise and magnify thee forever and ever. Amen. Immaculate heart of Mary, be our salvation. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.